Uh, my name is Peter, uh, Peter Vidos. I'm from Hungary. I traveled here representing uh, our startup that we built there called Vizu. And uh, as you will soon enough learn, we're into animated data visualization. Uh, we have a technology that we built from the ground up. And, and I've been traveling into these conferences for some time now. I have the luck of being invited to, to show what we do. Uh, but uh, this is the first time that I actually have the chance to share the stage with somebody else. So as things go, we, we had some time uh, with our tool. And then actually last year, I was here at Python in New York, and I managed to get in touch with Katrina Real, who was the head of data at Streamlit at the time. And she got excited about what we do. And she introduced me to none other than Zachary Blackwood. And he created, yeah, I think he, he deserves a big round of applause, even without knowing what he did. So uh, he, he actually created an integration of Streamlit of Vizu into with Streamlit. And uh, when I got to know that he's coming to this conference, I was very keen on, on having him with me on stage. So um, for today, our goal is uh, for you to have fun and to get your hands dirty. So uh, if you want to participate, you would definitely need a laptop or a team of people around you from which at least one of you should have a laptop with internet access. There was uh, some sort of a description on the, yeah, on, the, on the schedule about what you need to install in order to participate. Uh, how many of you have read this, is, this installation instructions? Oh, wow, five people. OK, uh, yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, that's, that's more than I expected. And, and that guy over there is cheating because I already uh, ran over their crew and started asking questions whether they checked the, the tech intro part. OK, that, so the first part will be quite frontal. We tell you what we're dealing with and how it works and give you a lot of examples on, on the possibilities. And then the second part will be individual teamwork. And hopefully, we will have some time towards the end where some of you would just share their apps with us, their Streamlit apps. And then we can just show them on stage and discuss uh, how, how they were done. We prepped with some uh, sample data sets as well, but you, can, you will be also able to use your own. Um, but first things first, I mean, no, this is the first thing second. I don't know. I'm, I'm not a native speaker. Anyhow, I would love to get to know you a little bit. So uh, like, how many of you are data scientists? Hands up. OK, roughly, I don't know, 20%. Data engineers? OK, another 20. Python developers? Um, everybody else? OK, who hasn't had their hand up in the last three questions? OK, we, uh, you. Uh, can you tell me what, what do you do? I mean, I'm just curious. Like, um, I currently work in audit, so not data and data at all. But OK. Uh, ah, cool. And so glad to be that you're here. OK, uh, have any of you ever used Streamlit? Hands up. Mm -hmm, roughly 30% maybe. OK, people have their hands up and then put it down. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, have you ever used Vizu? Uh, no hard feelings here, so uh, nobody. OK, that's basically the answer that I expected. So let's start with what Vizu is. Anyway, one, one other thing. I, uh, during the session, I would want to make some photos and videos uh, of you working on it and, and ourselves. Is there anybody who has some issues with that? Perfect. OK, so what is Vizu? Let's start with that part. Um, Vizu is basically, so what we created is an engine that uses a single logic to generate all different types of charts. And because of this uh, aspect, this approach that we embedded into our engine, it can also interpolate between these charts that are expressed on its interface. It's as simple as that. It's a generic chart morpher. And uh, we, we have, like, you know, next logical question, why would someone build a generic chart morpher? So we, ha we have a vision that we're working towards. As I said, we're still an early stage startup. And this slide shows what vision is. It's basically, we try to teach, uh, let people work data in a much more visual fashion than they do right now. This is like this vision is more about general business people rather than experts like yourself. We would want them to be able to explore, analyze their data visually, and then turn them into animated data stories right away. Reuse them on reports and dashboards, and maybe also for um, 
for forecasting and planning. So that's that's a big plan. We we've been in operation for some time. We managed to close our, our pre-seed funding round earlier this summer. So if everything goes well, uh, there should be a tool coming out, a point-and-click tool without any coding interface uh, for basic business users early next year. Uh, and uh, so why is animation important? That might be the next logical question. Yeah, like first we yeah. So static static charts are pretty abstract. When you have uh, different views of the same data set, like in this case, these are about uh, Donald Trump's tweets, but that's not important. Uh, so uh, it might be hard to make the connection between them. It might be hard to understand uh, what one shows after the other, especially for non-experts. Whereas if I connect these views with animation, uh, everything becomes really clear. No further explanation is necessary. And, uh, and that's, that's really cool, and there's a lot of uh, you know, brain resources to, to, to save uh, when, when you want to get somebody involved, when you want to share their insights, for example. And uh, based on all the surveys that we gathered so far, uh, people like you spend roughly half the time explaining what is on a chart and just the other half explaining why it matters. So this way it can save uh, something on that side. Uh, a couple of examples, so you can drill down using animation when you have a complex composite index and you want to show the components of it and, and their relation. Uh, you can um, also uh, just you know, show uh, the part to whole relation and, and uh, make it really easy to understand when there's a component that goes against the trend. Uh, you can uh, switch from uh, aggregate view to distribution over time, for example, in a very easy to follow fashion. Um, you can obviously uh, show change over time using, for example, uh, um, uh, a chart like this, uh, a racing bar chart that were so popular in the recent years that they've been banned from the data's beautiful subreddit at a certain <laughs> point in time. Uh, and um, yeah, so, and, and you can actually turn one chart into a whole story, like a pie chart that if you add something on the y-axis, will turn into a story showing how much money different companies uh, producing mobile phones made over the years. And uh, just from the single pie chart, we get to, um, to the understanding of having these leagues of companies uh, making totally different amounts of revenue uh, from basically producing and selling the same product, or the same type of product at least. So uh, something about our technology, the core engine, this data morphing engine is in C++. We're using WebAssembly to compile it in the browser. Uh, after we uh, raised our initial funding round, we released a tool for JavaScript developers back in 2021. And that's when we turned our attention towards data scientists. Uh, the first tool we released over like almost 18 months ago, no, over 18 months ago, called IPyVisu. And uh, that ran in Jupyter Notebook and similar computational notebooks. And then we added a little extension that enabled uh, people to build, uh, present, and share animated data stories right within uh, a, a notebook, a Jupyter Notebook or a similar one. We have a ton of integrations. All that we do this so far is open source and free. And thus, uh, we get contributions like the ones you can see on the screen. Uh, like these, most of them were done by, by others than, than our core team, which was three people at the time and only one of us are a coder, and it's not me. So uh, if you have deeply technological questions, Zachary is a much better person to talk about, talk with, and if you have deeply technical questions about Visu, I'll try my best, okay? Um, but uh, yeah, so that's about it. And let's turn to, I mean, I'll, I'll show you how the whole thing works and then I'll give the floor to uh, Zachary to, to show what Streamlit is. Uh, actually, everything that we prepped for you can be reached if you are following this bit.ly link. So bit.ly slash streamlit underscore visu underscore NYC. Oh yeah, sure, I also have it in a QR code format. So you, you can use that if that's easier for you. Uh, you will end up in a repo folder that, uh, that, yeah, that, that has everything that you will need. Um, okay, and let's start, I mean, let's continue with, oh, I forgot to do this. Um, so I wanted to show first like what you will be able to build towards the end of this session. This is a Streamlit app with a Visu chart in it. It shows how much revenue different music form has generated over the year in the US. And the user here can just uh, set the time frame differently and can also just uh, switch from, uh, from, from revenue to volume or uh, 
you can aggregate uh, the data by format instead of by year, uh, add more formats to the chart like this, and then sort it by value, which is pretty cool. Uh, and there are a ton of other views that you can generate using this interactive report. But also it gets saved in the background. And I told you about IPyV as a story. So this is the kind of story that I just download here as an HTML file and open it up in my browser. And it basically contains all the views that I generated. And I can just scroll through them using a clicker. So every step that I took while I was using uh, the, the, the report there was, got preserved, like when I was switching over from uh, revenue to volume, and then I accumulated everything by format instead of by year. So basically, you can build apps in Streamlit using Visu that would enable anyone without any coding expertise to build an animate, and present animated data stories like the one that you can see on screen. So that's the goal we're working towards. Yeah, sorry, I forgot that. And yeah, the rearrangement part. So. Um, yeah, how does IPyVisu works? Um, it, I, I'm going to show you a quick example in a notebook just to get a sense of the logic that we employ. And good news, you don't have to learn it. We built an app for you that does most of the heavy lifting of using this, of employing this new logic and, and using IPyVisu syntax or Visu syntax, okay? But I think it still makes sense to get some understanding of how our tool works. So I would just really quickly go through it in a Jupyter notebook that's on the screen. We have a single method called the animate method. You call it once, it gets to a static chart. You call it once again, that chart will morph into another chart. And you have the opportunity to give a data to your chart, set the configuration, uh, set the styling of the chart. And you can also fiddle with the animation options, like how the animation happens. Uh, you can install it using pip or conda. It's uh, integrated with the pandas data frame. And here in this example, I'm going to use the Titanic data uh, just as an example. And I create an empty chart here. Uh, this is, again, not something you have to remember or anything. Uh, this is a Jupyter notebook. I just hacked the CSS a little bit so the output appears next to the cell. So you can see the code and the, and the output right next to each other. And so the first animate method is uh, I'm just adding the count, so the number of passengers on the x-axis, the sex on the y-axis, and also the number of passengers on the label, and we get a bar chart, okay? It's easy as that. Now, what I do is I call the animate method once again, and I add the survived category, whether that passenger survived the crash or died, uh, on the x-axis and also on the color, and I end up with a stacked bar chart like this. And if I remove uh, the survived category from the x-axis and add it to the y-axis, then it gets into a group bar chart. Easy as that. Uh, you, you have a ton of options to play with. Like, for example, the data part, it lets you filter the data that is shown. Right now, I'm going to filter to only people who traveled first class to see how, how this chart looks to them. And as you can see, it happens also in an animated fashion. I just re-ran the cell. I can uh, use circles instead of rectangles for geometric elements. And when I do, I can add the same value on the size of the markers. And I can switch from um, like Euclidean coordinates to polar, and I'll end up with a chart that no one understands. <laughs> so uh, it's, uh, yeah, like that's what happens when you have a generic chart morpher that employs a generic logic. You can actually build charts that are hard to understand, even though they employ the logic of every chart that is out there. And yes, you can also play with the styling. So I'm here I'm just going to style that uh, the markers should have a different color palette, for example. And like the diet turns out red and the survey green. And yeah, that's about it. So there are a ton of options like this. And again, the good news, you don't have to learn how they work. You just have to understand the logic of it. And so without further ado, I'll give the floor to Zachary so that he can let us know how this whole, how, what Streamlit does. Uh, there you go. <clears throat> All right. Uh, I'm Zachary Blackwood, and I uh, came to work at Streamlit when uh, a couple years ago, and then we got acquired by Snowflake. And my favorite part of my job is I get to build lots of Streamlit apps, and I get to build those uh, for use for internal stakeholders. And I get to help other people on the on other data teams across Snowflake build those, and I get to work with some open source things like Vizu. So uh, it's a lot of fun, 
and I want to tell you date about Streamlit. Some of you, this is you, uh, a good ch chunk of you have have used Streamlit before. That's exciting to see. But I want to give a, at least a quick overview, if any, for those of you that are unfamiliar with it. So there's a classic problem, which is you got the data and you know how to do an analytics, but you want to have a way to share it with your with your stakeholders. You want to you want a way to be able to communicate uh, communicate from the data. And, and create something that you can actually give to a non-technical person. You can actually give to a business uh, leader, someone who can actually make decisions. And so Streamlit is a really great solution for that. It's, it's really just a generic app building framework. So you can take some Python code, and it builds you a web app. Um, it re it's really focused around data, but people use it for all, all kinds of crazy things. Um, the, the, the gist of Streamlit is you write a Python script, and you run it with this streamlet run command, and then it spits out something like this on the right. And it really is, um, you know, as you can see, a relatively small amount of code to produce a pretty nice looking app. We have great designers, uh, and at least I, I'm not a designer, but I think they look pretty good. Um, and it's very easy to iterate on. It's very easy to it's very easy to tweak things and play with it. Um, one of the my favorite things about streamlet apps is they're they're interactive by default. You have all these different kinds of widgets. Um, like you would with with many dashboard kind of building app building tools, so you got sliders and date pickers and all those things. Um, you can do some some basic theming. Uh, we'll, we're actually trying to figure out how to expand that a little bit and not let people make too horrible of uh, theming decisions on that in the future. But you got some basic options on that, and because it's uh, it's all in Python, you can pretty much use uh, any Python library that you want to. Um, in terms of the, the output of that, if there's visual output, we'll get I'll get to that a little bit later. But in terms of behind the scenes, it's just a Python script. It just runs your Python script, and whatever you can do in a Python script, you can do in a Streamlit app. Um, so the basic gist of how do you write a Streamlit app is well, again, it's a script. It runs from top to bottom, and if you have if your mental model is it runs from top to bottom, it'll work really well. Um, it's actually that's you know it, it is really how it works, and whenever you interact, it runs again. Um, and the widgets, those those date pickers and, and check boxes and buttons, all those interactive pieces, you can think of those as just the output of variable, and that variable has whatever the value is. So if it's a checkbox, it's either it's a Boolean value. If it's a slider, I get a I get an integer or a date or whatever kind of thing you're sliding across. Um, and uh, you know, some of you are already thinking, oh, I don't want to rerun my app every time. Well, one of the things you that is built in from the early early ages of Streamlit is you can choose which parts you want to not rerun and to cache. Um, so you can reuse those values over and over again um, and not have to do the expensive part. So it starts out with a really, uh, really something basic like st.write, which is a generic way to say, put this on the screen, it takes markdown or pandas data frames or all kinds of other things. Um, and then you, can, you have basic plotting tools like st.line chart and other, other ones like that. You see these widgets like x equals st dot slider. So then, for the rest of the the rest of the time, you don't have to think. Oh, there's some complicated feedback mechanism going on. X is whatever the slider is, and that's just that's just how it works. And you just move on down. You don't have to think in terms of okay, there's actually a callback that's going to make this change into this, which is going to feed into this. You just think okay, x is going to have the value of the slider, and wherever I use x, whatever the slider was, that's what x is. Um, and then there's these built-in uh, there's built-in uh, methods called cache data and cache resource. Cache resource being there's a thing I create once and I want to reuse it for a long time, or if um, or there's some data that I want to compute where maybe I pass a variable into it, and if the, as long as that variable doesn't change, I don't want to rerun this computation. I'm querying a database or I'm pulling I'm pulling data from an API. Um, I don't want to do that over and over again, and so these cache methods are built in for that. All these slides um, are, uh, there's, a, there's a link. If you didn't get the, we'll put the Bitly link up again. These slides are available on that, by the way. Um, so all these sort of, sort of interactive, interactive things, you can you know, do fancy things like, like uh, have, you know, use the webcam and things like that, as well as basic things like upload a file or click a button. And there's all kinds of different widgets. And the docs are great. You can just go to docs.streamlit.io. Uh, you'll find all about all these things. So that example I put up earlier with uh, with some where it showed a table and showed a line chart. This is basically what it comes down to. First thing you do is you load the data, and this shows the example of how you do that with caching. 
So this, this uses st.cache data to say that I always want to return, once I, I'm gonna fetch it the first time and then, for, and then it's gonna cache it in memory and the rest of the time and just gonna reload the cached one. So it's, if it's a very slow, if it's a very big file, you'll load it once and then it'll be fast after that and it'll just return the cache data frame. You can control things like TTL, how long do you want to go before the cache gets cleared, um, things like that. And then once you've got your data, you've got a pandas data frame, or really any kind of you know any kind of uh, any kind of data format, um, then you uh, add some widgets. So for example, here you want to filter down to particular kinds of countries. This this uh, multi-select lets you pick different options, and you can X them out or select them, uh, and then you can use those. And so this is just this is just some you know some pandas manipulation. You take it and you you filter down to just those ones. And then you do st.write to put a nice, some text. And then you do st.data frame to put the data frame. And then you do some transformations. Um, and then you end up, with, uh, end up with a chart like this. In this case, we're not using the st, the built-in streamlet charting. We're using Altair. You can use uh, one of any number of charting libraries, including the zoo, that we'll get to in a, in a little bit. Uh, uh, but, but most any, any kind of charting library you can think of probably is, is, is pretty well supported in Streamlit, and there's your full top to bottom script that's not too many lines to get a pretty nice looking, pretty nice looking app that you're ready to share with your stakeholders. Um, there's all kinds of more detailed things, like you can control the layout. Uh, oftentimes you would just make a simple app that's just top to bottom, but sometimes you want, row, you want to split things up between different columns, for example, things like that. Or you want to have even multiple pages for your app, so you can have a sidebar where you select different pages. Um, and there's all kinds of third-party components that I'll get. I'll talk a little bit in just a minute about those. Um, this example shows the way you can just set up your you set up your repo. You set up a folder that has an app dot pi, and that's your main. That's your first page, and then everything that's in pages, all the Python files that are in the pages folder, just become pages in your app. And so that you'll see in, in this example on the sidebar there, there's your this. It builds this for you just based on whatever is in the pages folder. Um, and yeah, there's a, uh, we've, we've, uh, it's been fun to, to be, uh, working at Streamlit when, uh, lots of people wanted to build really quickly and really easily build, uh, LLM apps and, uh, Streamlit is a pretty, is a pretty fun way to do that. We, re we relatively recently added these, built these, uh, native chat widgets. So if you haven't used it in a while, you, these might look unfamiliar, but, um, but it lets you it lets you very easily build a, a a chat a chat kind of chat style app where you have messages back and forth and you have a chat input at the bottom and you don't just have text but you can have charts and things um, as part of the messages uh, so it's pretty nice for that there's lots of people have been using these to build lots of different lots of different uh, AI powered apps as you might as you might guess uh, so there's all kinds of fun examples um, this is the one that picture on the right is from um, is from our home uh, on, the, on the website. You can look at, see different examples and different categories that people have made a different app. So uh, lots, of, lots of integrations there. Um, again, it's Python, so you can probably pretty much use it, but a lot of these we've really worked to make sure they, they work well. We've worked a lot with partners from these companies. Um, uh, the docs are great, the forum's great. I personally spend uh, some time most days on the forum. I'm kind of slacking this week. Um, but it's a great place to go and just find lots of lots of answers to lots of different questions that people have. Um, the docs are delightful, uh, and people are building lots of apps, and it's it's really fun to see the new exciting things that people build. A lot of them are kind of the straightforward things that you'd expect, and then sometimes people build a dungeon crawler in Streamlit, which is not really what Streamlit's made for, but you know why not? Uh, it's all kinds of beautiful ones. Um, encourage you to check it out. Uh, the other thing that, that Streamlit does, what we've had for a good while, is we host your apps for free. If you have a public GitHub repo, um, you get a, a free, uh, we'll, we'll give you, we'll host it and run it, run it for free. And as long as, you know, you have limited amount of RAM and disk needs, should work just great. So we have many thousands of, many thousands of apps that are on there and it's all free and there's not even a paid version of it. You just you just uh, get what you get, and it's a few clicks, and wait a little bit for the fun food animations to finish, and then you've got your app, and you can share it, share it with people. Uh, 
If you never use Streamlit, this is how you start. We'll talk more about this when we get to the hands-on bit, but essentially pip install Streamlit should just work. Uh, you know, we recommend a virtual environment and all that, all that good stuff. You can use pip or conda. Uh, and there's even a way to, there's a built-in way to do it with code spaces, so you don't have to install anything. But if you have installed it locally, you run Streamlit Hello, and you get this nice little welcome app. Um, I want to talk about components because because one of the basically the reason I'm here is because I worked on this component uh, with Peter and others at, at Vizu. Um, so one of the, the so the Streamlit core team is building lots of functionality and lots of things built into Streamlit itself, but there's a whole world out there of other things, and, and there are other libraries and tools that aren't baked into Streamlit, and so there's this, there's this big question of, okay, I have my Streamlit app, and I want to use this thing that doesn't, doesn't work with it natively. Well, some of it just does work natively, so you might just try it. Um, there's a lot of things that, like, for example, if it works in a Jupyter Notebook, there's a decent chance that some version of it will work in your Streamlit app as well. Um, uh, but th there's also cases where that doesn't work. Um, or sometimes you can just, if you have just some HTML, you can just embed it directly, and, and that sometimes works okay, but a lot of, sometimes you want a little bit more of a native feel and native control. And so that's what the component system is for. So Streamlit has had this ability to create components which are these, which, are, which feel a lot like they were built into Streamlit, but they're actually made by third third-party developers. Um, and this is what uh, I, I'm going to talk about and you're going to see with, with Vizu where I built some custom, wrote some custom code, released it on PyPI, and now people can install it to, to work with Vizu more natively in Streamlit. Um, there's a bunch of components out there. There's a, there's a, there's a section on the website, uh, streamlit.io slash components, I believe is the URL, that'll show you some of the really popular ones. There's a lot out there. There's a couple that I've uh, helped with. Um, and if, if you have some expertise and you have a Python library or a JavaScript library that you find doesn't work, I'd encourage you to make a component for it and, uh, and release it. And I even wrote a blog post about one way to do that um, that you can see on there. Um, so Streamlit Vizu, there are, as you saw, there was this already this amazing C++ library, even better, there's a JavaScript library and there's a Python library to interface with it and it worked pretty well in notebooks already. It didn't quite work natively in Streamlit. You couldn't do things like, well, you'll see later, you couldn't click on a chart and get data out of it and use that to update other parts of your app. So uh, I thought, what if we could just hijack what it already does and build a component on top of that? So, so in reality, yeah, I, wrote, I made the component for this, um, but really it was mostly working on the, building on the work that had already been done and just hacking around until it worked. So I'd actually already done this with another, with a friend uh, on another component called Folium. Folium is, an, is a similar tool in that it, there's, there's a, it's based on Leaflet, which is in JavaScript. Somebody wrote a Python uh, wrapper around that. And so I hacked into it to make it work in Streamlit. So, and that's what you'll see today with Streamlit Vizu as well. It takes the, the underlying work of PyVizu, which is designed to work in notebooks, and add some, add some new abilities in that so that you can get bi-directional feedback. It can, the, the, the app can talk to the, uh, talk to the chart to update it, and the chart can talk back to the app um, to change other things. And that's about Streamla. Uh, we'll have time maybe for questions later. Thing. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Okay, so uh, the next bit is about showing you an app that has Streamlit Visu in it, um, and and show you the code right next to it. So these apps serve two purposes. First of all, they are basically a step-by-step -step tutorial. So we start simple, and then it gets complicated, and then for the sort of individual work. Uh, you have the code there, so feel free to copy and paste everything and reuse it on your own data and, and you know, add some more functionality. So it's also kind of like inspiration and code to copy from uh, that are very straightforward in, in their functionality. Uh, and um, <clears throat> so basically this is how uh, this uh, a Streamlit app that has Visu in it looks like. It is just a single Python file. Uh, just similarly to a notebook, we need to import some components. Here it's not IPyVisu, but Streamlit Visu, but it basically has the same objects that we had in, in IPyVisu, so config data, style, 
and Visu chart instead of chart. And initially, we just create a, a simple chart here. Uh, we, we create a very sophisticated data frame with uh, uh, one categorical and, and one numerical series, all both containing three values, x, y, z, and one, two, three. We uh, create a, an empty data object of uh, IPyVisu or, or Streamlit Visu. And then we call the addDF method of that data object uh, in order to add the data frame uh, to the data object. And then we add the data object to the chart by calling chart animate data. That creates an empty chart with the data already loaded. And then what we do here is we basically animate, again, calling the animate method with the configuration of x being on, uh, so the category being on the x-axis and the value being on the y-axis and a title, look at my plot. And that's the result of this animate method that you can see on the screen. Now we also have the checkbox here uh, with the conditional uh, that if the checkbox is uh, checked, then the chart should animate to the uh, state where actually it's uh, the value on the x-axis instead of on the y-axis and the category on the y-axis instead of the x-axis. So if I click on swap, the chart is going to swap. Uh, yeah, let me just zoom out a bit here so you can see the whole chart. Yeah, that'll do. So um, yeah, I can, I can swap back and forth. Very basic, very understandable. First app, okay? Uh, you can also click on any of the elements and under it, this is what the bidirectionality that uh, Zachary was referring to. It writes the value of the click bar under it. So you get data out of it. I'll show you a more sophisticated example right away. Now, uh, let's use a different um, interactive element uh, of, uh, of, of Streamlit, the slider here. So here's, the, again, the music data, how much revenue different music formats generated over time. And uh, I put the year on the slider, and if I change the year, then the values uh, shown on the chart change uh, to show only uh, the revenue that was, that was generated in that particular year. And uh, the, uh, the, the chart, so the items on the charts are, uh, are ordered by value. So as you can imagine, it changes over time. As it's basically a racing chart, racing bar chart you can control with this slider. And uh, the, the code for this, I mean, the first part is basically the same. We just uh, read a CSV file, that's a pandas feature you, I'm pretty sure you're all familiar with. Here we add a key and we set the height of the Visu chart, that's also very straightforward. Add the data to it and we turn on the tooltip feature. This is that if you move your mouse over the chart, it will show you uh, the value uh, represented by the underlying chart element. And then we add the slider like this. So we create the year variable and we set it that it uh, should have the value uh, set by the slider. Uh, we set the minimum value and the maximum value and the default value in one line of code. It's easy as that. And then, uh, so what we do here is we call the animate method with the data filter on where it says that uh, the year should be, oh, this should be actually equals equals and not less than equal because then it sums up all the values. And you see, I changed the code and rerun it like that. So this is all run locally, but basically, so if I change it back, and uh, then Streamly tells me that the underlying code changed, so you can see source file changed over there. And if I rerun the code, then we animate to the new, the, the updated app, easy as that. So it's actually not music revenues in, but music revenues up to. And if I save that and rerun, we will change the title, easy as that. And uh, yeah, here we also set the, the styling a uh, little bit. So we add a color palette and, and, uh, and, uh, and, a, and a number scale so that the numbers look nicer, except for when they are on the tooltip. Uh, sorry about that. We're an early stage startup, as I said. Uh, and uh, we set also the animation option, the delay down to zero. Uh, initially, when you call the animate method, there's like a one second delay before the animation starts so that it's easier to follow along after you click on a button, for example. But here, I just want everything to be smoother, so I want the animation to start right away. And I set it by uh, setting the delay to zero. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's how you add the slider to a chart. Let me show you one example where uh, we employ the bidirectionality of the component. So basically, once again, music data, you see the total values for each year on the chart now. 
And uh, right now, if I click on any of the columns here, uh, we are just going to zoom in and then drill down and split it up like that. And if I click on anywhere else, we get back to the original view. So again, if I move my mouse over, click on any of the bars, we zoom in, we drill down, we regroup, and then we have the details. And so the way we to do it is uh, we basically, so this was built by Zachary. We do everything the same up to uh, here, basically. So what we, there, there is a bar clicked variable which gets uh, the year category from the marker that has been clicked. So the, just one variable, year. And uh, if bar clicked is none, then we have the animate data filter should be empty. And then, you know, year is on the x-axis, revenue is on the y-axis, color is empty, whatever. But if we have something on the, within bar clicked, then we should employ a filter where the year equals to bar clicked and uh, the revenue is not zero. Now this part I added just last night because uh, let me just remove it and you'll see what it means. So if I zoom in now, uh, I will have all the different music formats, even the ones that have zero value for that year. And that's, I mean, it, it looks nicer if we, if we have it like this. I just undo the changes, save the file once again, and then I'll only have, yeah, you see, it updated instantly. I'll only have the values uh, that, that are different than zero. And that's it. So you have an interactive uh, animated chart where people can just click on values and zoom in and drill down. That's pretty cool, right? And uh, the whole thing is like 68 lines of code. Uh, okay, the last example I want to show you the code of, and then for the, all the others you would have the chance to explore on your own, is uh, kind of like an explorer, like basically a chart which we put a lot of controls around uh, to let you uh, just fiddle with, I mean, let uh, the user of the app fiddle with what's on the chart exactly. It's some made up sales data, uh, so it's not really important. It's from a company that sells stuff and uh, generates revenue from different products in different regions. I mean, I'm pretty sure most of you had some experience with the excitement of this. Uh, so basically now we see the sales, so the number of items of, per product in a Cartesian coordinate system arranged, uh, sorted alphabetically. But I can change it to show the revenue instead of the, the number of items, uh, show product and region both, like then uh, the, the regions will be added on the color or just region and then it will morph to column chart, aggregating all the revenue that was generated per, uh, per region. I can uh, just yeah, order them by value, and, and I can switch it to polar, which again is not a chart we're using too, too often, no wonder why, but uh, it, it shows you the capabilities of this engine. And uh, yeah, so in order to test how to fiddle with the styling element, uh, Zachary added this little color picker, so I can turn the background color of the chart very ugly. Here you go, it is indeed very ugly. Um, <clears throat> let me try and get it back to normal, like white at least. Uh, this should do. Yeah, Ooh. All right, so uh, the way this app works is that we have uh, added some multi-select. Oh yeah, we can, we can actually remove products. This is the one control that I haven't used. It has a list of items, as you can see. Uh, we added some uh, five columns into which we added like a radio button that reads measure and that has the option sales and revenue and reads the value being set here into a variable called measure. And so for all the five we did that and what we do here is just basically we have one animate method towards the very end that calls data filter filter which was set by actually this multi-select thingy, uh, the config that, that only has config here and then it's set like Okay, so label should be measure, Y should be Y. And depending on different conditions, basically up in the app, we set these. So if compare by is product, then on the Y axis, it should be the product. And on the X axis, it should be the measure, which could be either sales or revenue. And then on the color, there should be nothing. If compare by is region, then uh, the measure is on the Y axis instead of the X. So it basically just changes, so this one sets what's on the X and what's on the Y axis based on the, the results of these three radio buttons. Uh, and uh, so 
as you can see, we have these seven different controls uh, here that all change what we see there. And all we need to do is, is combine them in order to have the end result, one configuration and one animate method that basically reruns every time you change something in the streamlit controls. So that's how you make an interactive report or a, or a dashboard. OK, so for all the other examples, I just don't want to show the codes to save time. You have all these in the, in the repo folder or in the, uh, there's actually a different folder, different repo for the Streamlit Viso intro, but you have a link for that. Uh, so this is, this is the original thing that you saw. This is what the bit.ly link led you to, the PyData NYC workshop folder. And here is uh, where you can see the tutorial app, then the other app that, that uh, Zachary will show you in a jiffy. And then here's the, the link to the uh, repo folder, the repo of, of this app that I've just been showing to you. And that I, again, I encourage you to copy and steal from. No, just copy. There's no stealing involved. Um, yeah, and this, uh, so a couple of, I, I already showed you this one where it's, it's another explorer, but you have the opportunity to download uh, every view that you generated as an interactive story. You can also build a dashboard. So like, what's a dashboard? It's one uh, app with multiple charts, right? So you can add more than one Visu chart to an app. They can all react to the same controls. I have no idea where this is here. Um, and um, so for example, if I change the years, then the content of these charts change too. And that's all about that. They, they show obviously a very like drilled down or like very filtered, aggregated views, the top three years and the share of formats within the data being viewed. And for that, it's just like I, I had to add more charts. And I also fiddled with the, the animation options. So every, actually, this chart changes first, and then this, and then this. And in order to do that, I just set the delay differently. So one wait for the other. Uh, and then uh, there's also the opportunity to work with the editable data frame that uh, Streamlit has. So for example, uh, there's like some made-up data of, uh, what are these? Pokemon, thank you very much. So, and I can change the value here in this data frame that I can see. Whoops, I wrote something that's not even on the chart. I, like, I make it active and it can be seen right now. Uh, I think the width is not set properly, but I can still zoom out a little bit more and then, yeah, we'll see the fourth bar. It, it can, it, uh, in, the, in the other example, it will be set properly. And so this would let the user copy and paste some data to it. And, and just fiddle with it. And yeah, actually there's a more advanced version. This was all created by Sebastian Flores, a great guy. He lives in Chile. He's the first person who delivered speeches about Visu in Spanish. And, uh, and I just love to work with him and, and uh, he integrated. So he did this example of integrating Visu with, with the editable data frame. This is a more complex version where uh, you can add uh, new columns uh, to the data frame even. So the user can add new columns and decide whether they are values or categories. And uh, yeah, so, but, and, and can change the, the, the chart type that's being used. And uh, yeah, a lot of other stuff. So uh, I, I would encourage you to take a look at the code if you want to employ some sort of functionality with the editable data frame. And now comes the surprise that we prepared for you to make your life easier using Visu. We've been working on it in the last two days, especially Zachary and David from our team. I'm eternally grateful for them because I was just telling them that they had this feature and that feature and then uh, told them when it's not ready yet. So I would let uh, Zachary take the honor and show you how it works. All right, so the idea with this, the idea with this app is you upload, upload a CSV, it's got you know, some tabular data, uh, I, we included some sample data just to make it easier if you don't have any lying around. Uh, one of the first things you can do is you can you know, take a peek and see what the data looks like. And here's, here's where we got some music stuff. And we can add filters to the data. So for example, maybe we really only care about certain genres. And so we're going to, you're going to filter those down. You know, we don't, you know, whatever. We don't care about pop, right? Um, and the you know, so far, you know, we're just clicking buttons, but ultimately the goal is that this is generating uh, not one chart, but in fact is generating a whole series of charts just to show you the kinds of charts that you can make um, from a data set like this. And for example, you can select a different uh, second categorical variable, and if I hit update charts, then you can see all of those update to show the, 
what happens if you have these two categorical variables. Um, and you know, it's, it's drawing a lot of charts, so give it a second. Um, and with each one of these, you can then look and see the code that's required. So here's pulling the data. Uh, here's creating the visu chart. Here's where you do the filtering. And here's where you do the config. And then you do chart.show. Um, and uh, as a bonus feature, which uh, I did not add, but is very cool, you can uh, take, pick a couple of these. And if you want to create a story where it transitions from one of these to another, you can just pick a few and add them to your, add them to your story. And then this, this lovely uh, uh, IPyVisu story player at the bottom here. And as I said, we just built it for you. So there may, be, there may or may not be a bug there, but you can see here the transitions from these from one chart to the next that we did this. And we can, you can delete, delete them to clean it up. You can download the story and get the HTML file that you can then share, share with somebody else that just has these, um, that has those transitions and those different pieces of your story. So zero to lightning talk about your data in, you know, in one app. That's, that's kind of the goal, uh, the goal with this, is, is, is to show you what you can do and actually be a useful, a useful thing. And, and the link to this, this is live uh, on, running on Community Cloud today. I think it's called Visu Builder, Visu Builder.streamla.app if you want to try it out. Again, you know, we're working on it up, up till pretty recently. Uh, so it's the world premiere, uh, and there, there, are, there are almost certainly bugs, uh, as you could see. Um, yeah, I think that's. Yeah, uh, and I think it's, it's important to note that there are a couple of uh, goals in this app. The first one is to show you that basically the chart types depend on how many categories and how many values you want to see on the chart. Uh, so by changing that, uh, let me change the background slide because you will see it better, uh, the online version. So if you, like here by default, it adds one category, like genres, and one uh, value, popularity. But you have the option to add another category and another value. Actually, different chart types would be generated on the number of different series. And to, to get this, uh, it's really easy for you. You just have to decide what should be on your chart. And it will give you all the options that we have for chart types that are well known and uh, can be generated using Visu, OK? And, and the other is to help you with generating code uh, for your apps, for your notebooks, for your stories. So all is here. Obviously, if you add more chart, then, then it's just easier not to copy and paste all of it, but just maybe the, the animate part, uh, because you know that's, that's actually belong to that chart. All the other stuff is to set it up. But we created the code here so that you can just copy and paste it to a new, uh, new uh, stream with Visu app or Streamlit app, and then it's good to go. You will, you will end up with this chart right away. Uh, and then thirdly, we want to help you build data stories. I mean, I would love to see one of you stand out uh, tomorrow and do a lightning talk with iPyVisu story. I will definitely try to be there and do it on my own, but I would love to help you out doing so. And so when you add a chart to a story and, and then it appears beneath uh, the, the, the list of charts, you also have the code for that story. You can just copy and paste it to a notebook and fiddle with it within the notebook, like add styling elements and then rearrange slides and whatnot. So again, we just wanted to make it real easy for you to get started without having to learn this intricate, very abstract logic of our tool. OK? Cool. So. Uh, we're actually approaching the part where we will give the floor to you, or at least your laptops to you. Uh, there are, I think, um, yeah, basically two things before that. First of all, I always do a selfie with the crowd because I have to prove the guys back at home that I actually made it to New York <laughs> and, uh, and, and delivered this. So if that's OK for you, I mean, and, it, and I'm, I'm just so happy that uh, right now I'm together here with, with uh, with Zachary, so I bought a very sophisticated selfie stick, and uh, we will just uh, stand there and try to make a couple of photos, if that's okay for you. And in the meantime, you should start thinking about who you want to be in the same team with. We strongly encourage you not, I mean, you can go alone and, and do everything and, and build an app on your own, but 
as always, I mean, learning new stuff is easier when you have someone to talk with, like, why is that, why this shit doesn't work, for example? That's a very logical question. And, uh, and we'll be here to help you out throughout the whole time. But if you can do it with somebody else, that's even better. So maybe take a look around you and, and see who you would want to you know, have this or share this opportunity with while we're so that is this generates a whole post. And you're essentially using that one versus the nurses that you share. Correct. Okay, can I uh, have your attention for another second? Can you can you look around here and uh, say Vizu on the count of three? <laughs> so one, two, three, Vizu. <laughs> it's the top. It's a... Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. How many of you have not found a teammate that would want to work in a team? Okay, looks like everybody is all set. Then uh, what I think you should do, uh, so we, we try to, we try to s uh, just uh, list it within the repo folders readme, how you, could, how you could start working. So first, find someone to work with. Check out and get through the installation guide below. Uh, there's an installation guide. There are actually two versions, for those with experience in Python and local development, and for those new to Python packages and local setup. Uh, obviously, this letter, this letter is, is easier. You would just use code spaces uh, after setting up a, a GitHub account and a Streamlit account. You might want to set up a separate GitHub account for this, because uh, uh, Streamlit asks permission uh, to read all your public repositories, and there are people who don't really like that. If you're one of those, just you know, create a new GitHub account just for this. Can you pull the Bitly again? Um, the Bitly link, yes, absolutely. Um, there you go. So it's streamlate underscore visu underscore NYC. No, it's just, I mean, yeah, okay. Uh, can I uh, switch back to the, does anybody need the repo for, okay. So uh, once you're done with installation, fork the repo of the tutorial app. Just fork the repo, you'll have all the code there. Uh, you can, I mean, um, like Zachary will show you how easy it is to do it when, when you're doing the easy version and you want to use code space. Get some data. There are sample data sets within this repo folder in the data folder, okay? There are some CSVs ready for you to analyze and visualize. And uh, create a new Python file and reuse snippets. Use the Builder app to generate IPyVisu code. Be creative and then share your app. Do you have any questions about what I just said? Okay, I'll let, uh, so here's the tutorial app. Uh, yeah, we should go to the online version, I guess. 
And then, uh, can you please show people around here how to fork it when you're using the online version? Yeah. Let me zoom in a bit. Okay. So take a closer look. It's yeah. going to be. So if you're if you want to use if you want to use pip locally or conda locally, that's great. Uh, if you'd rather not, or you, it's some you have some issues with it. Um, Streamlit Cloud recently added this new feature where you can fork an app. Um, I don't know 100% for sure if this will work well since he's already forked the app probably on his account, but we're going to try it anyway. But so what that will do is that will it will prompt you to either sign into or create a, a, an account, and it will spin up a Code Spaces instance for you, where you have uh, the code editor, basically VS Code in the browser um, on the left, and you have and it'll open up it'll open up a browser, a little mini browser inside the editor on the right. Um, and by the way, when you create a community cloud app, it gives you this opportunity to, to customize the URL. So it's you know something related to your repo and then some gobbledygook if you want. And it's not taken, you can call it whatever you want, my cool data app app or something. Um, or you can just leave it the way it is. And then if you hit fork, that will clone the repo. It will create a fork of the repo into your GitHub account, and then it will pop open an editor where you have, without installing anything locally, you'll have um, you'll have a, uh, a ready-to-go editor on the left. And after a few seconds, it will open up a, a little preview of what your app will look like on the right. And you can just edit it in there, save it in there, and then it'll, it'll already be there on GitHub for you. So thanks to Microsoft for free code spaces minutes. Yeah, and uh, for the venue. And for the venue. <laughs> For the free venue, spaces in virtual and physical world. So if you have any issues uh, with with particularly getting your everything set up, so you can actually create vis, uh, create these stream of apps, uh, please raise your hand. We'll, we'll be walking around. Yeah, and just, uh, absolutely. Just so we know, how many of you are actually planning to do this? Like, try to build a Streamlit app on their own right now. Hey, so there are some. Uh, Cool, just please let us know if we can help you, if we can help you figure out just why the code works in the tutorial app, why it doesn't. So it's, it's okay not to build something new. It's okay to use the opportunity to ask us in person to give you a more detailed rerun of everything we just said. But it's also, we'd love to have you build your apps or just a short data story with the builder app. We're, we're here to help, there are no expectations uh, we just want you to have fun, as I said in the beginning, okay? So if you have any questions, just throw up your hand and we'll be there to help you.